I'm Belinda Goodrich. And I'm Brandy Bean. Welcome to See How I Did That. This is your opportunity to get engaged and inspired by our guests who have overcome obstacles to achieve success. Real women, real talk, and and real real inspiration. inspiration. Your transformation starts now. And I'm Brandy Bean. And on today's episode of See How I Did That, we got to interview Jennifer Eggers. And I thought I this was my favorite episode that we have ever done. I just so you know that. I think so. She well, I think we laughed more during this episode than any other interview we've done. Like to the point that my face hurts. So I think that's a that's a good sign. And we were talking about her concept of resiliency and how She came to be in that space, and our story is definitely inspiring. It is, and I love resiliency. Obviously, if you've listened to my um, episode, it's really about your mindset and how you are able to move forward with things, not necessarily bounce back, because as we know, that Denver told us, that it's always changing, right? So you don't necessarily want to go back there. You just want to move forward, and she does a great way of talking about how to do that for yourself as well as your organization. organization. Yep, and her book title is Resilience. It's not about bouncing back, how leaders and organizations can build resilience before disruption hits. So here is our interview with Jennifer Eggers. Welcome to See How I Did That. I'm Brandy Dean. And I'm Belinda Goodrich. And today we are here with Jennifer Eggers. And let me tell you, I am so excited. This is this. this is your topic. This, this is, is my thing. This is my thing. Resiliency. <laughs> and I just I'm excited to hear your point of view on resiliency because I do believe it's kind of in the eye of the beholder. And so I'm just so excited for this interview. And Jennifer, why don't you start off and just tell us a little bit about you and how you came into the space? Yeah, sure. Um, So, I mean, I was sort of the consummate overachiever. I mean, I, you know, I was president of everything in college and then uh, got into the corporate world and I started in my career in consulting, um, went, you know, from there into different leadership roles at some pretty big companies. Um, And somewhere along the way was, it was for about 10 years, I was the top 50 competitive, um, competitive water skier, uh, nationally ranked. And so, I mean, I was burning the candle at both ends. I was, um, you know, like I said, just the overachiever. And then um, kind of one thing after another hit me. And so the first was, um, I had started um, two companies in my career. The first one um, <clears throat> didn't work out. And then uh, I was in a couple of car accidents. And so, you know, one took me out of training, one took me out of competition. And then um, right when I was coming back two years later, uh, I was training for the first time, trying to rehab, um, and was diagnosed with an illness that basically meant that I could never do cardio again. And so I went from this like crazy, (laughs) um, you know, full on 90 to nothing energy to really nothing. And at the time, I mean, I was still in a corporate role and one thing led to another, I mean, just a series of of events like that have happened in my life. And so I guess it was about maybe um, five years ago, I had started, I had started leadership. I had left my corporate roles. Um, and I thought about the speaking business. And so I reached out to, you have to be able to say something when you go into speaking, right? You have to actually, I know you know. So, you know, it's kind of basic. So I reached out to 10 people that knew me really well. And I said, what's the story that only I can tell? I mean, really, what is it? And to a person, 10 people got back to me and said, you are nothing if not resilient. And so I thought, well, that's great, but everything I've ever taught, and I do a lot of leadership work in my, in my business, but it's all, you know, most of it was based on work from Harvard and Columbia and MIT and places that really smart people come up with theories, and then we find a way to implement them in real life. So I didn't really want to talk about me. <laughs> that was really, really hard for me. So I took a couple of weeks, and I went to really think about what was it about me that allowed me to bounce back And at the time, I was still kind of thinking bouncing back, you know, but what was it that really allowed me to come back from all these setbacks, Um, whether it was an athlete, I mean, there was a time where I had a car fire and dove out of a flaming vehicle. I mean, I had all of these really crazy things. And 
I realized that there was some very, very intentional preparation that at the time I wouldn't have intended it to be more resilience, but it, to be, you know, I wasn't thinking, oh, I'm going to build resilience. But I did some very clear things that allowed me to be resilient. And so as I started thinking about what those were, um, I still didn't want to talk about me. So it became, well, A, can it be taught? Can someone replicate it? And can we um, teach it to corporations? And can we help organizations become more resilient? Which was a whole lot more important to me than you know, working, frankly, with individuals. But what I found out was that we have to build individual resilience first, first of all. So there is this whole element of coming face to face with yourself in this process, um, which was definitely true for me. But I built, I built the framework and the model and it became a keynote was the first, the first thing I did. And the very first, it was one of my very first keynotes I ever did. And the first time I did it at a big conference, I got, and this has never happened before or since, so not bragging here, but I got a standing ovation and they rushed the stage. The next speaker could not get on stage because the crowd had formed at the bottom. And I, and I walked with, when I finally got off the stage, I said, if I do nothing else in my life, like, I don't care if I have to live in a mud hut. I mean, this is it. And it doesn't have to be speaking. Um, So the the keynote became a three day workshop. Um, We can do it in two now, but, and then um, a lot of consulting that goes with that. And now we're doing a lot of, we do a lot of work with corporate leadership teams around in the resilience space as well. Um, But that's kind of how I got, that's kind of how I got here. Um, And so wrote a book last year. So the keynote became a workshop, became a book and the book is called resilience. It's not about bouncing back. And the idea is that resilience can't be about bouncing back because things are changing so fast that by the time you try to go back, there is no back. Back is different. So we, I have a belief um, in my co-author. I have a a co-author that wrote it with me, um, who was actually the woman who introduced me to a number of these concepts many years ago. But um, we believe that resilience is really about um, being energized and elevated by disruption so that you can come back stronger and more resilient faster. That's really cool. One thing that really stands out to me is that you're talking about organizations, but you you bring it down to the individual level. And it's if we as individuals don't understand resiliency and how to move forward as a as a group, there's no way you can do that. So I find mm-hmm. that very powerful, um, regardless of what your audience is, is being able to be true to yourself and say, okay, how do I personally handle whatever situation is thrown at me? So kudos to you, because I think that's that's brilliant. And companies, I believe, really need that. So um, I I love this topic. I love how you got there. And I, I do agree with you. It's not bouncing back. It's just, you know, moving forward. And and because everything's changing. I mean, from today to tomorrow, everything's going to change, even in the slightest bit, to being able to just push forward and adjust to those changes is, is really critical. I was going to say, it was actually someone in my audience that said, by the time you go back, there's no back, there's no back to bounce to. And I thought like, as soon as she said that, I mean, it was a, it was a, she's a a really like one of my favorite executives. She owns a bunch of family businesses, kind of, you know, manufacturing space. She's really this dynamic, amazing woman. And when she said that to me, I was like, that's it. (laughs) Um, And the notion, the individual piece is interesting because I, I think we, what the one of the most exciting things in my research that I found was that the characteristics of resilient people and resilient organizations are identical. Mm-hmm. And so this notion, I mean, there's really three characteristics. And so that was so cool to me that they're the same for individuals and organizations, because that meant I could teach it and yeah. we can help individuals get it. And then they can help organizations get it. Mm-hmm. Right. You mentioned that you, um, one of your first companies wasn't a success. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? <laughs> yeah, it was fun. You know, it's kind of, we, we live and learn, right? I was very young. I left Arthur Anderson. I was doing business consulting early in my career with no corporate experience. You know, I mean, I went right, in, right into consulting out of college. Uh, it was this very heady, surreal role. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, I left there. I took a client with me when I left Anderson, negotiated my ability to do that, and started a company just so that I could continue working with this particular client. 
And I think at the time, you know, you have one client, you think that everything's just going to work out from there, but I literally knew nothing. And so <laughs> why would anyone hire someone that had never worked in an actual corporation to do consulting? And so everyone asked me that, you know, when I joined Anderson and then when I tried to start my business, it became painfully obvious. So, um, Empowered Synergy was the name of our, <laughs> was the name of the company. And we lasted about a year. Um, just with this one account and then uh, folded and decided that I better learn something about corporate politics because I knew nothing. And I, I went um, into a corporate role that was incredibly political, working for Larry Bossidy at Allied Signal and um, kind of cut my teeth there. But at the time, I just had no idea what I didn't know. Right. You know, and I, I think that's that's so important. I think there's a certain I would say thread that's consistent between yeah. the three of us of let's jump in, let's do this and, you know, yeah. kind of, kind of ta nice. tackle things. And it's funny because I, you know, can compare us to some other folks that I know that are very more hesitant and like, well, but I don't know that. And I'm like, well, yeah, but I'll figure it out. So I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll go, go at you one even with the, uh, what would you call it? Empowered Synergy? Empowered Synergy. Was, and I even think back to the name. I'm like, that wasn't even a good name then. You ready for this one? You know what my co my <laughs> consulting company name was? I can't even say it with a straight face. <laughs> it was passionate excellence. Wow. And little did I know that when you have the word passionate in your company name, no. the entire internet world thinks that you sell sex or something. <laughs> so That's a hilarious. <laughs> well, I can't have quite abandon it, so then I became passionate project management, which sounded like <laughs> sexy project management. And so, again, spam filters everywhere. We couldn't even send, like, our newsletters out. They always got blocked. So, you know. I love it. We can definitely laugh now. It was <laughs> really talking about the restaurant, too. Uh, yeah, and then I had a restaurant. Yeah, don't do that. I watched the Food Network, decided I could open a restaurant. Of course. Um, you know, and so when people, people will ask me all the time, I'm like, are you afraid of failure? And it's like, and I have to laugh. I'm like, it's just feedback. Like, <laughs> it just tells me, you know, I was a little off course with this one. Like, yeah. like let me write the ship, you know? <laughs> I think that's, <laughs> I that's, think so that's funny. an important message for, for you to sh be sharing and for, for us to share on, on a public platform to say, yeah, you might not get it right. And that's, that's the okay. expected mm -hmm. is that you're not going to get it right, especially the first time out. You know, I think that's have, huge. Yeah. That's such a huge lesson. I mean, and the other thing is, I think the big career lesson for me is, you know, you got it. The sooner you figure out what you don't know, the, the better off you're going to be. You know, and at the time I was, um, you know, I came out of things with a fair amount of um, bravado and overconfidence, you know, and I think as soon as you, when I learned to say, I don't know, things got a whole lot easier. Yes. And I still have that argument with consultants I work with today. In fact, um, you know, I had a business partner for a while that, another lesson, but, um, <laughs> but we had this, you know, we used to have the argument around, well, don't ever ask a question you don't know the answer to. And I thought, if I know the answer, why would I ask the question? You know, to me, to me the beauty in what I do is going to being able to get in there and ask some questions that I really don't know the answer to and we'll learn together. I think that's, but it took a lot of years to get to that point. <laughs> it does. It's a, it's a process. You know, we, I know a lot of our listeners are either just are considering making the move to be like self-employed. Oh, wow. Okay. Like that. So I know that we have a pretty big audience. Or they just the, started or, you know, they just started a business. Yeah. They're, they're transitioning. And I think that that message is so important for them mm -hmm. to know that, you know, you're not necessarily going to come right out of the gates and get it right, but you can adjust. And I, and I love the idea of moving forward. Resilience is the ability. It's not, bouncing back it's it's definitely you're adjusting as you go adjusting your sales and in today's environment we have to be able to develop that healthy resiliency um to to continue to look forward and say okay well what did that teach me you know what was the lesson out of that okay sure. how do I apply that and that's one of the characteristics of resilient people in organizations so I said there were three one is the ability to find meaning in situations so when something goes horribly awry, are we actually able to figure out what did we learn from it or how can we make sense of it in a way that reframes it so we can move forward? Right. So Brandy, did I cut you off? I didn't mean to no, cut you off. You're totally fine. You're totally fine. I was just going to say that, you know, being able to 
take a step back, understand that you may not know everything and that is totally 100% okay, but to make the, you know, agreement with yourself saying, hey, I may not know this, but I'm going to learn it because it's important. Mm -hmm. And then you're constantly growing. Nobody knows everything. And I think being able to give yourself that grace of, hey, I am not an expert in every single thing in this field, but I'm expert enough to know where to find information or Mm -hmm. know that I'm allowing myself to learn more. So I think that's very critical. It's okay to not know everything. And I think you used a word that I really resonate with is giving yourself the grace. Because I think for many, many years, I was terrible at that. You know, and we self-talk ourselves to death. And, you know, figuring out how to do more positive self-talk is something I, you know, I sort of poo-pooed for many years. But as as we can learn to give ourselves grace, we give ourselves the freedom and the space to be able to be more resilient. Yeah. Um, and the thing I'll add, the, so the thing about resilience that I, I sort of, the way I think about it, and Brandy, I'd be curious as to if, if you see it similarly, but I kind of look at it as, you know, you've got this, this tank. So if you picture a gas tank, um, you fill it when things are good and when things are calm so that when things, when you're in disruption, you have some extra energy that you can call upon when you need it. And so I think things that help fill the tank so that we have enough energy when we need to use that extra, uh, when things go awry, are really super helpful. So the the self-talk does that. I would uh, 100% agree with that. I know for me, when I've been in situations where sometimes you almost feel like, "Is is there any way that I can just move forward, make any sort of adjustment, you call upon those things that, you know, are in the back of your mind, like, okay, I've been in a situation where I felt that, like this before, but I was able to move forward. Mm-hmm. And so being able to keep those little wings in your head so that, and essentially they're in your tank that you can just call yeah. on when you desperately need it the most. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. And it's so funny, I think about affirmations and all I can think about, you know, Saturday Night Live, right? The <laughs> old, old skit, you know, right? And <laughs> Thank you. And, they, and so I was the same way with you. I was like, yeah, okay, that's silly. Um, and now it's something to me that is, it's a daily practice, you know, and I have to stay at it. And I'll even notice when I get out of that practice, it's like I wasn't really the soft, fluffy type, you know, so I'm oh, meditating. Yeah, no, I can't sit still. <laughs> now it's like part of my daily practice and I'll notice the difference on the days that I don't do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a good portion of my career has been in HR, and I'm probably the least soft, fuzzy HR person in the universe. Um, So I've had to force myself on some of those practices, too. But, you know, resilience, what, what, and kind of the, the way we talk about it is resilience is about the preparation. So when you're in the moment and things, you're facing disruption, you're in the heat of the, in the, uh, the heat of the battle, it's about coping. But resilience is about the preparation you do ahead of time so that you don't have to think about it when you're coping. Those are like, we distinct, we differentiate between those two things because to, to me, resilience is all about the preparation in advance. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a good point. It's something that people don't necessarily think about. I mean, and you can look anywhere across any aspect of our life, right? Whether it's financial, we, you know, we were doing a podcast interview with this wonderful lady that's a, a CPA and she was talking about, you know, whatever amount you're putting towards your debt, you should be putting an equal amount towards your savings. That's kind of genius. We always think just get rid of the debt, get rid of the debt, get rid mm-hmm. of the debt. But that idea of preparing ahead of time for yeah. the situations, and I think that's what you're saying, is, 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 yeah. incredibly, is incredibly powerful, mm-hmm. strengthening yourself to be ready. Um, and we, we're kind of in the midst of a, a little bit of a panic <laughs> in yes. the world. And uh, mm. we know that the coronavirus, what is it, COVID-19 mm-hmm. is what the, the new name, yeah. I think for, for Corona Beer got kind of the, <laughs> the, short, end of the, the short end of the stick on this one. <laughs> you know, um, we see people buying lots of toilet paper, which I still, I, I'll be honest, I haven't figured out the correlation. I guess it's because they think they won't get out of their house or... I don't know. But how does resilience play into situations yeah. like that when you get kind of this mass panic going for lack of a better phrase? That's like, I mean, that's a great phrase for it. And I, the first thing I'll say is that panic helps no one. So I don't think, I mean, anything that we can do to dispel this panic, I think is really, really important. And so, you know, I think it's important to arm yourself with facts, especially about a virus like this. I think it's important to understand what we know. And there's a lot we don't know. So the fact that we don't know doesn't 
mean it's the end of the world. I, but I, you know, and that's not to say don't be prepared. I think resilience is all about being prepared. But the way I think about it also is you handle what you can control and the rest you don't worry about because you can't, it makes no sense to worry about what you can't control. But I can control whether I took my vitamins. I can control whether I have my sanitizer with me, whether I, um, you know, have a way to communicate with clients if they suddenly start cancel meetings. You know, is there a way that I can continue to run my business and do things virtually? I mean, you can prepare for a lot of things before disruption hits. And I think that's, you know, the biggest thing. And, and I, when we think about our resilience framework, I mean, it's, all, it's really all about um, you, the, your mindset and the choices that you make. And then underlying that is really your core beliefs. So I think your core beliefs come into play when you deal with things like this. Right. And this is where, I mean, I'm unique in the fact that when we do corporate workshops, we talk about that and I don't shy away from it. And I will, um, you know, I don't share my faith from the standpoint of someone else needs to have the same faith I have. I share my faith as a, as a evidence that when it, when you need to stand up, it's really hard when you have nothing to stand on. So it's important that you know what they are, whatever they are for you, whether you believe in your rabbit's foot or Jesus or the Buddha or whatever, right. it's important that you know what's true for you. And I think that really helps in a situation like this um, because it helps you make choices that are in keeping with your core beliefs and it helps you determine what your purpose is um, and choose the mindset that you're gonna have. Right. Operating from a place of fear is not a place of resilience. Yeah. So the more we can focus on what we control, the better off we're going to be, whether it's um, the Wu-Tan flu or whether it's um, dealing with whatever um, comes our way in business. Right. And I think you made a, a really good point of being prepared regardless of what exterior factors are happening. So being an employee in a big organization, you know, you can only control so much but if you yeah. are taking care of yourself and taking mm -hmm. care of your immediate circle, then that's all you need to worry about. So why panic or fear the worst when you have zero control over that? So and that's right. something that's a way that I live my life is I'm, I'm I try to only really worry about things that I can control because if I can't control it, why why even put that negative energy towards it? Why why do any of right. that? It does nothing for you. It's not that's helping. Really good points. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, no, really good, really good information. And I think that that's a good message to get out there, like you say, because I think some people are, and you know, certainly not to, to take away from people that do have certain illnesses, immunity, suppression, yeah, things like absolutely. that. You know, and I, I was talking to someone today about it because if my mom was still alive, may she rest in peace, um, she, she would be now. freaking out yes. right now. And she probably would have made us take her to the emergency room about 16 times to be tested for the virus, even yeah. though she's never been <laughs> exposed. So, you know, I can just picture those conversations, you know, and as I'm getting on an airplane, her saying, you can't be getting on an airplane <laughs> with this stuff going on, Belinda. Thanks. Great. You know? <laughs> well, and you know, I, I, I fall into the immunosuppressed category myself. So, yeah. you know, I'm not gonna tell people to do things to put their lives in danger, but you know, my dad ordered 150 masks last week. I don't care if everybody gets the flu, you're never gonna use 150 masks. And <laughs> you know, I mean, there's things like that. You know, Amazon delivers pretty regularly. Within 48 hours, you can get just about anything you need delivered to your door. Now, I hope that that continues during all of this. But, right. So certainly we want to prepare for, you know, if you have to be quarantined or whatever, but I don't think it helps to panic. With your book, who is your ideal audience, your target audience for your book, Resilience? And that's a great question. I mean, we wrote the book thinking um, corporate leadership, director level and above was who we designed the book for. Now, here's the really interesting thing, right? So that's the target market we wrote the book for. I have gotten phenomenal feedback from stay-at-home moms. I've gotten feedback, great feedback from people who are retired. I mean, it is absolutely amazing who the book has resonated with. So um, I'm a little shocked by that, frankly. But the thinking was that it was really meant, what we were trying to do is to, there, part one is really all about building individual resilience. And then part two takes what you learned as an individual and applies it to your team or your organization. So what we were trying to do is give it to the people who could take it and apply it to a broader team to try to help companies. So it's sort of the business self-help book and the business leadership self-help book. 
Um, but it's amazing. It's, it never ceases to amaze me. The calls or the, the emails we get from people who I least expect it to have resonated with. It was interesting though. I had an early, very early on, I had a, um, agent who I subsequently let go of, but she, at one point before we started, before I even, you know, started writing, she said, go to the bookstore and look at the different sections and sort of see what section you want to be in. Because we could have gone into business, pure business, you know, lane. We could have gone into self-help. We could have gone into the Christian space. I mean, there were a lot of different places I could have written a book for. And it was really funny because I walked into the business section and I was like, oh, this is like a bunch of, you know, a lot of hot air. And then, you know, I went over to the Christian section and I was like, well, I can't compete with that, you know, and then I, <laughs> and then I, I just didn't feel worthy of that. And then I went over to the self-help section and everything was pink. And I said, I don't, like all the covers were like clearly geared to women. They were very, yeah. very pink, very um, flowery covers, things like that. And I thought there's nothing here. And I've read a lot of self-help books because I'm kind of into that. But there was nothing there that really resonated with me as a business person. And I thought there's a whole group of people that were missing. So yeah. to me, it was combination, like a leadership self-help book. And it's why people think we're different in workshops too, because that part of what I've learned is that, you know, I can stand there and espouse, uh, you know, theories and leadership, you know, academia. Um, I'm very comfortable in that space. But what really resonates with people is the story you tell that makes it come, come to life, or even better, the story you make them tell that puts exactly. them in the model, right? And yes. that's the piece that I think, I think that's where our workshops are just really different because they, yes. they just get into the real heart of what's going on in an organization and with, with people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the space I love. So it was not the safe space I set out necessarily to be in, but it is the space I love. Yeah. Um, and that's been fun. It's been a fun part of the coaching as well, I think. Yeah. And that, that's a big part of the, the, the switch I made was bringing in more of the personal stories. And like you say, when you hear other people and their stories, stories are so mm -hmm. powerful. So they are. I bet your workshops are absolutely amazing. They're so fun. You are, I'm so excited that you are on our show. So much good stuff. And I said, again, anytime, I mean, we live in a period of uncertainty anyway, I think just indefinitely now, but obviously today there's even more things going on. And I think your message does resonate individual up through cooperation. So we really appreciate you being with us. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. And I really, I even more than I enjoyed being on, I enjoyed listening to your podcast this morning <laughs> as I was listening to some of the other guests. I think you guys have really put something special together here. Um, and you're right. I mean, I think it does jive with the times today. So thank you for getting this out to the world. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of See How I Did That with Ms. Jennifer Eggers. And if you want to learn more about Jennifer, you can find her on the web at leadershiftinsights.com. That's leadershiftinsights.com. And then you can also find her book, Resilience. It's not about bouncing back on Amazon. And we just really hope you enjoyed this episode. Like we said in the intro, this is definitely one of our favorites. And we hope that you got something out of it. And in today's world, we all need to be a little more yes. resilient.